All right, I'm going to start a timer because I know I tend to get long-winded, uh, but it's easy to do when you're passionate about something. And number one, let me just say thank you to Josh and to this church for being great supporters of Speed the Light, okay? Without your generosity, like working out in the tent yesterday meant something to me. Like I played a part in what you guys do every single year. And like I have big plans for you for next year. All right, like I tend to, you know, I was uh, texting someone in our office because they saw a picture of uh, one of the big boxes of fireworks that were out there in the stand. And he said, hey, how much is that? And uh, I told him, and he goes, man, that's awesome. I said, we should do this at home next year, the 4th of July. I'm coming back out here next year, and I'll bring everything home. I said, because, you know, I don't really do anything small. And he just said, LOL. That's my life. Okay. I don't really know how to do things uh, in, in, a, in a mediocre way. I, it's go big or go home for me. That's my mindset. So I've already made contact uh, with WorldServe International. Okay, through Speedlight, we're partnering with WorldServe to build water wells in Africa and beyond. Uh, right now, we are trying to get clean water to many of the Native American Indian reservations here in the U.S. 40% of the reservations here in the U.S. don't have running water inside their homes. Okay, imagine that. Here we are, a blessed nation, and we still have 40% of the American Native fellowship that do not have clean water in their home. So it's one thing for us to provide clean water overseas, something completely different for us to do it here in the U.S. So I contacted those guys and I said, hey, what would it look like if next year we came in and put a water well, just an, a model of it on the property, and we raise money through the, the fireworks stand for a well in Africa and the U.S. And the neat thing about that is NFL football players are matching those funds. So I'm trying to get an NFL player to come next year to the property, okay, to be a part of that. So God's just doing some amazing things, and, and it tends to happen when you lead with generosity, okay? That's just how God works. So first of all, let me just say this. If you're here this morning, I want to encourage you, if you feel like you're supposed to respond at the end of this message, please do, okay? There's a reason the Holy Spirit speaks on behalf of of the Father in a setting like this because he really wants us to act. And, and it's not about money. Today, man, I'm challenging you that you just give your heart completely to God because we get to change the entire world. I don't take that lightly, okay? I'm a redneck hick from Pennsylvania. My claim to fame, I can skin a deer in three minutes, okay? True story, okay? Like, I don't deserve anything that I have. I have a wonderful family. I brought a picture with me because they can't travel with me the way that I do. But this is my crew. Uh, standing next uh, to me, my youngest, Emma, in the blue dress, and then my son. This was just a month ago. My kid got married. I still can't believe it. Uh, Matthew is 21, his wonderful wife, beautiful. Another daughter that I have, Taylor, my wife, Liz, and Abby, my 19-year-old, on the end. My wife and I are celebrating uh, 23 years of marriage next month. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a journey that I don't deserve, but it's, she took a risk on me. That's all I'll say. And, and from that day, I've been taking risk ever since. You know, 2004, I made a decision to leave my family in Southwest PA and step into full-time ministry. Okay. I knew I was called. At the age of 16, God called me to do this thing called preaching the gospel to the globe. I knew I was called, but I had to take a risk because in that small corner of Southwest PA, my entire family lived okay, within a 10-mile radius. My Mom's parents, my dad's parents, their parents, their brothers, their sisters, the, all my cousins, we all lived in that one small corner. And people told me I was absolutely crazy for leaving that, okay? But I knew that God was placing something upon my heart to do this, this thing called spread the gospel. And I didn't even know what I was stepping into back in 2004. And here I am 17 years later, and man, it was the best move I ever made, and, and as I started thinking about that word risk, okay, what does, it, what does it mean to take a risk, okay? So I did what we all do these days. I got on Google, and I typed in the word risk, and I started reading articles, and I found one. And this poor guy, okay, after his name, he's an author, but it says unknown. Like, how would you like to be an unknown author, okay, right? I mean, hey, read this article by this unknown. So, but hey, six things that he wrote to take, six things we need to take a risk. Number one, we need to understand that failure is going to happen. Number two, 
He says to trust the muse. The muse is that thing that you can't kick. It's that voice you hear in the silence, that thought that brings continual excitement and fear all at the same time. I, I now understand that the muse in my life is the Holy Spirit. Okay, the Holy Spirit speaking to me. It's that thing that brings excitement and fear all at the same time. Number three, to take a risk, we have to be authentic. Number four, we have to be of clear mind. Number five, we need to fully understand what you're risking and you have to be all in. And number six, know that you typically only get one shot. Know that you only get one shot. So here we are, okay, and I travel across the nation. Like, I leave today, I drive up to Iowa. I'm speaking a week of youth camp in Iowa. I go home for three days. I go back to Iowa, speak another week of youth camp, okay? Like, this is my life. Like, I love traveling. I love speaking. I love getting people to pursue the gospel with their lives. My fear is that sometimes we live in this very shallow form of faith that we were never intended to lead with. Okay, that God looks at you and I specifically, and he created us to be conduit in which the darkness sees in such a way to where it flees. Right now, like I love this missional generosity that's taken over across the, the nation. Okay, Speed the Light, the highest given year for Speed the Light given was in the year 2000, $12.6 million was raised that year. This year, we're on pace right now, we're 5% on pace over where we were in 2000. And it's absolutely insane how it's happening. Like, I've never seen anything like this in my life. But it's happening because churches like you and DYDs like your DYD, Darren Stroud, are pursuing missional generosity. And what's starting to happen is the enemy is starting to counter. I see it everywhere. He's countering in my own family. He's coming against us. And I got DYDs that are, they're sick. They're being attacked from every angle and they're starting to become really depressed. And I'm calling them up and I'm saying, what did you expect? Okay. I told one DYD, I said, hey, listen, I'm talking to you as your friend right now. Suck it up, buttercup. Okay. Because we say we want purpose in our lives. We say we want our life to stand for something. We say that we want to follow Jesus with everything that we have. And when we do, things start to happen and we tend to shrink back. But that's what happens. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the, the principalities and powers of this dark world. Okay, when you're in it, you're in it and he's going to come at you. The question is, the church should be concerned when the enemy's not coming at you. You hear me? We should be concerned. If the enemy is not coming at us, are we living a life that's stagnant? Have we not taken a risk in such a way to where he's fearful of our existence? And this leads me into who I want to talk about this morning. Okay, there's one prayer in the Bible that when it's spoken, it, it changes everything. It changes absolutely everything. It restores our faith in such a way that we can go into every single day knowing that no matter what comes our way that he's got it covered. And this prayer was spoken by a POW, okay, in, B, in, in uh, 500 BC. His name was Jeremiah, okay? Jeremiah was in prison and he speaks this prayer after he makes a pretty large investment in Jeremiah chapter 32. It's a big deal because here's the backstory Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. The prophets have been prophesying that an enemy was going to come and ravage the city. Nebuchadnezzar had just finished his third and final raid on Jerusalem and everything that he touched now laid in ruins. He turned this prosperous city, the city where God was raising up his temple into nothing but ruins. He has taken tens of thousands of young people as prisoners of war and all that is left is rubbish, a temple and a wall that has been destroyed. And then God speaks to Jeremiah at that moment, who's currently in prison, and he says this. He says, everything's been destroyed, but I want you to buy some real estate. Listen to the scripture, Jeremiah chapter 32, starting with verse 6. It says, the Lord told me that Hanamel, my uncle Shalom's son, would come to me with a request to buy his field at Anatoth in the territory of Benjamin because I was his nearest relative and had the right to buy it for myself. Then just as the Lord had said, Hanamel came to me there in the courtyard and asked me to buy this field. Now, how many of you would say that's a risk not, not worth taking, right? Everything's been destroyed. It's gone. It, it's, it lies in ruins. 
And God says to Jeremiah, hey, listen, the property is yours. I'm sending your cousin. All you have to do is buy it. That's a risk not worth taking. But we read, it says, so I knew that the Lord had really spoken to me. So I bought the field from Hanamel and weighed out the money to him. The price came to 17 pieces of silver. I signed it and sealed the deed, had it witnessed and weighed out the money on scales. Then I took both copies of the deed of purchase, the sealed copy containing the contract and its conditions, and the open copy, and gave them to Baruch, the son of Neriah, and grandson of Messiah. I gave them to him in the presence of Hanamel and the, and the witnesses who had signed the deed of purchase and of the people who were sitting in the courtyard. Notice this. Not only does he buy the property, he buys it in a very public way. Do you see that? All these people are around. Why is it happening this way? Okay, why is it that Jeremiah felt in that moment that not only was he to buy the property, he needed everyone around him to know it? And then it goes on. Before them all I said before them all I said to Baruch, the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, has ordered you to take these deeds, both the sealed deed of purchase and the open copy, to place them in a clay jar, so that they may be preserved for years to come. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, has said that houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. Jeremiah buries this deed like a seed waiting for harvest. Understand this, the person who looks for quick results when they are burying something will always become disappointed. When you bury a seed, there will always be long stretches of darkness and visibility and silence that separates the planting of the seed from the harvesting of it. It's as if God is saying to buy something that's in seed form, bury it, and watch what he's going to do. What is God saying to Jeremiah? He's saying, you see rubbish, but I see buildings and vineyards that are going to come back to this land. How easy is it for us today to look at the current state of our nation and our world and make a decision to hold on to the things that we have? Okay, missions, both domestic and foreign, require a process of sowing. Sometimes when you sow, you have to wait, even when you can't see results produced. Jeremiah is looking at this and God's saying, bury it. It may be dark, it may be invisible, it may be in silence, but I'm working and watch what I'm about to do. So when it comes to missions, God is saying to you and I, you may see murder, riots, destruction, hate, famine, abuse, trafficking, and war, but I see buildings and vineyards that are going to be produced from the rubble. I see lives changed by the generosity of Mission Hill. Have we thought about that when it comes to missions? That God is looking at us and sometimes, sometimes we truly don't understand, okay, why we spend $300 on fireworks. We want to see a bang of a show, right? We're doing it because we want to see something. No, out there in that tent, what I saw yesterday, every single fireworks that went out of that tent, I was thinking, Jesus, because I know of the lives changed by that money given for those fireworks. It's so important when it comes to what we're facing as a nation and globe. Jeremiah begins to challenge us that if we hope in what we give and if we know that what we give is worth the risk that he's going to move on behalf of us. Three things I want to point out when it comes to generosity. Sometimes God will ask you to do something ridiculous in order for you to see the fantastic. Fantastic. Really, God? Jeremiah could have said, are you kidding me? You want me to buy this and build out there? Do you see what I see? Okay, but we can't be afraid to try new things. Okay, you know why? The ark was built by amateurs and the Titanic was built by experts. Right? Can't be afraid to try new things. If the amateurs have God on their side, I'll trust the amateurs every single time. And almost three years ago, as I stepped into this position... I was at National Youth Convention in Houston, Texas. I was speaking to a room full of students about burden for lost people. Students are running to the altar, giving their life as missionaries to go, being called to areas like Afghanistan and North Korea. And as I'm up on the platform, a young lady made eye contact with me. She pointed at me and she said, come here. I walked down off the platform and she said, God gave me a word for this room. There were 7,000 students in that room that night. I'm like, are you crazy? You want me to give you the microphone in front of 7,000 kids? She said, I wrote it down for you to read it. As I read this word, I've been sharing this word 
every single opportunity I've been given to hold a mic. This is a word God spoke to this unconventional generation of students, to Gen Z. If you're in this room, you're between the ages of 6 and 26. Stand up. Stand up. 6 and 26. Okay? For those of you that are on the 26 line, you're just on the border. For those of you that are younger, you're right in the midst of it. God called you out. This is yours. What are you going to do with it? It's what I look at my kids, my son, 21, my daughter, 19, my other daughter, 14. Okay, God spoke this word over your generation. What are you going to do with it? You can be seated. Young lady comes to the platform. She says these words, be prepared, change is coming. I am a God of unconventional ways, and you are a generation of unconventional anointing. I say it again, I'm coming back. Old ways no longer work. That's why I've called you. Church, listen up. An unconventional generation is going to change the world. I say this because there's no precedent to an anointing of this capacity. Chains will break in my name and my name will spread like wildfire. My anointing will pour out like never before. And church, I'm telling you, change is coming for I'm coming soon. You do not fight the plan that I have for your life because an unconventional generation can only be reached with an unconventional out anointing and outpouring of my spirit. And this is why I called you. Has change come to our nation? Okay, God spoke this word to this generation of teenagers almost three years ago. Be prepared, change is coming. There's an, un, un, there's an unconventional anointing and outpouring of my spirit that I want to unleash on a generation of students. This is what I see when I see students across our nation giving their paychecks and selling their vehicles and giving it to missions freely. It's unconventional, it's never been done. It's what I saw, okay, in this state just over a month and a half ago when they were doing Stream the Light. It's unconventional. It's never been done. What's going on? People thought Noah was crazy. Okay, you're building an ark out in the middle of a desert. What are you doing? It's unconventional. But let me remind you, okay, it was that craziness that ended up saving the people. Okay, him building an ark. So young people, as you're looking at your life and you're beginning to evaluate, God, what's my purpose? Okay, if you were to just to step into it. Okay, God say, man, I have you here because there are people on this earth that need to hear about me. Give your life to me. Is it risky? Is it crazy? Absolutely. Okay, it's crazy to think that we had students selling their laptops and pickup trucks. I watched as a group of students and youth pastors in South Dakota wrestling pigs for speed light. Like people gave money to that. Like, hey, let me go wrestle some swine. Swine the light, baby, come on. Like it's just nuts. Why is it working now? Because God has placed his unconventional generation on, this unconventional anointing on this generation. That's why. There's no precedent to an anointing of this capacity. When I think of that, guys, church, listen to me. The last time we saw something like that, an outpouring like that, it was in Acts chapter 2. What if? Okay, what if through this generation we see people healed? What if our students are the ones that lay hands on people who walk in this building that don't have legs and all of a sudden through the power of the Holy Spirit, legs? Like, it's insane to think those are the miracles that happen in God's word. If they happen then, they can happen now. Amen? But where are they at? Is it possible that we haven't lived in that kind of faith? Okay, George Mueller, who ran an orphanage in England, says that this kind of faith is a faith that does not operate in the realm of the possible. Okay, because there's no glory for God in that realm that is humanly possible, faith begins where man's power ends. Jeremiah knew that he could not fix Jerusalem. We can't fix our nation and globe, but God can. God can do something that none of us can do in our own strength and power. That's where faith begins. So it's understanding that sometimes God will ask you to do the ridiculous in order for us to see the fantastic. And secondly, just because something is forgotten by man doesn't mean that, it's, that God's forgotten about it. Let's talk about the number 42%. There's 7.76 billion people on this earth. These aren't the Assembly of God numbers. These are from Joshua Project. Okay, It's a culmination of, of, of all the denom denominations across the globe. 7.76 billion people on the globe, of which 3.24 billion people are unreached or have never been reached. 42%. We can continue to sit in church buildings every day of our life. There's still 42% of the people on the globe that are unreached. 
What are we doing about that? I tend to think that sometimes God celebrates when someone gives their life to Jesus thinking they could be the one to take the gospel. Maybe today, maybe, maybe today, Holy Spirit, inspire them to say yes, to give their life in such a way to make me Lord. Maybe today they'll be the one to go to the unreached areas of our, of our globe. Why? Because every buried promise is never forgotten. Every act of obedience is never forgotten by God. Trust plays an important part in this. I can remember as a kid, I used to go to my great-grandfather's house as he was getting ready to plant his garden. He would always let me plant the radishes. Always. Okay? I can remember, okay, we would dig that hole, that trough out, and I would go in and I would plant those seeds. Okay? Meticulously. And then I'd cover them back up. And every single week as I went to visit Pap, I would run out to the garden to see if my radishes started to grow yet. And then all of a sudden, I'd see them break out of the dirt And I'd see the leaves start to pop up. And they'd get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the curiosity just got the best of me. Okay? And I can remember walking down there and pulling this radish. And all of a sudden, on the end of the leaves was a toothpick. Okay? It wasn't radish. Why? Because I picked it too early. Okay? Was there something wrong with the seed? No, it was my fault. I chose to pull them out of the ground prematurely and I did not trust the process that in the silence, in the darkness, and away from man's activity, it's God who begins to bring it up. It's due to his power and his interaction and not us. That's why we do the fireworks tent. Okay, we may not see the seed immediately, but we still get to be part of the process. Okay, I want to encourage you. If you haven't volunteered out there, do so. Be the light in the darkness. Okay, the conversations that I had just in the nine hours that I was out there yesterday, I loved it. It was a ton of fun for me, Pastor. Thank you. Like, I'm looking at you guys like, I'm out there. I'm like, right now we have one Godfather left, one Godfather. I'm telling people are just walking in because I'm looking at, man, that represents lives changed for every single firework that's sold. What are we doing if we're not allowing our lives to represent him? God's looking at you and I because he sees us. And he desires for you and I to make a difference in this earth. You see, when I pulled that radish, the problem was I pulled it. And what I saw, okay, wasn't what was on the outside of the package. Is it possible that what God sees in you and I isn't what he envisioned us to be? That he wants us to be more than what we are because there's people all over this earth that are just waiting to hear about Jesus and God's calling you and I to reach them. We may not physically go. That's why we do missions. We get to give. Someone else is going. We get to support them. Students are being called. We get to send them. When we listen and respond with action, he responds with commitment. Some of you in the sanctuary have given to missions in the past, but you're like, ah, I haven't seen any fruit from that. I'm out. It's not up for you to see the fruit. It's up for you to bury the seed, to allow God to work in the darkness and in the silence. And it's God's responsibility to make it grow. If God spoke to you to give it, he still intends to produce through it. It may be inactive. It may be in silence. But God has never forgotten about your obedience. God told Jeremiah to purchase the land. And that made him responsible. You buy it. You bury it, and then you believe in God to do it. Sometimes God will ask you to do the ridiculous in order for you to see the fantastic. And just because something is forgotten by man doesn't mean that God has forgotten it. Smith Wigglesworth said, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm just moved by what I believe. And this is the final point this morning and the most important one. Believing in the beginning of the story really does matter. I love that song, Josh, Maker of the Moon. Man, you guys started singing it. I'm like, man, what a setup. Believing in the beginning of the story really does matter. We have to believe that God says who he is. He is the God of Genesis, and he is the God who sent Jesus to the cross. It mattered to Jeremiah that he's the God of creation because he staked his money and his future upon it. Okay, he publicly made it public. Hey, I'm not only going to buy this land, I'm going to make it public. And then... And then he became a creationist. He prayed a prayer that I'm going to share with you in just a moment. Okay, I need to tell you this morning, I, it drives me nuts to think that we have Christian evolutionists in our nation and on our globe. I just don't get it. I believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Here's where it gets cloudy. Okay, we have a lot of people on this globe 
that try to change the book that was created to change us. Okay? Try and manipulate it and twist it. That's not the way it works. That book was created to change us, not us to change it. Okay? Created uh, a Christian evolution to drive me nuts. Let me, let me share, you a, share a story with you about Isaac Newton. It says this, Sir Isaac Newton had a friend who was an atheist, and that friend did not believe in God, but preferred to take the position that the universe just happened. One day, his friend was visiting, and Newton showed him a model of the solar system that he began to put together. It was the sun, the planets, the moons. They were all in place. The sizes and spheres were in proportion to the planets, and the satellites revolved around the sun at their relative speeds. And the friend, admiring the model, said, this is so intriguing. He asked, who made it? Sir Isaac Newton replied, nobody. It just happened. Are you kidding me? So let me, let me help you with this. Let, let, me, let me give you four false facts. Four false facts. You ready? False fact number one. Books write themselves without need of an author. False fact number two. Cars build themselves without the need of a manufacturer. False fact number three. Music composes itself into beautiful harmonies without the need of a composer And false fact number four, the whole universe came into being through a process of random chance and beneficial mutations without any need of a designer. We have the most educated people on the planet who say that we need an author to write a book, a composer to have music, a manufacturer to have cars, but the universe just happened? Are you serious? I love what G.K. Chesterton said. The great English writer said, it is absurd for the evolutionist to complain that it is unthinkable for an admittedly unthinkable God to make everything out of nothing and then pretend that it's more thinkable that nothing should turn itself into everything. C.S. Lewis, man, that's in that moment where he gave his life to Jesus. Okay, walking with J.R. Tolkien. He knew that God was the creator of the heavens and earth. The beginning matters. I don't believe in a big bang theory. I believe in a big God theory. Jeremiah is a creationist and praise the song that I learned in church in the 1980s. Jeremiah in jail, looking at God's people in Babylon. He understands that God is on the throne. Jeremiah is in prison. God's people are POWs in Babylon. Jerusalem is in ruins, but God is on the throne. And it is it's, it's why Jeremiah does the only thing that he knows how to do in this moment. He prays. He prays and appeals to Genesis chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 16 and 17. It says, after I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch, I prayed, sovereign Lord, you made the earth and the sky by your great power and might. Nothing is too difficult for thee. It's in that moment, that, that prayer, that, that simple prayer changes things for us as God's people, okay? No matter what it is that's going on in our life, Jeremiah understood. He signs this deed. He makes it very public, okay? He knew that God was calling him to do it, but there he shrinks back. And in that moment to where the lack of faith began to creep in, I believe Jeremiah hit that point to where he cried out and he says, wait a second. And he looked around. And he saw God's creation. And he said, God, creator of heaven and earth, nothing. Nothing. No, absolutely nothing. Right? Come on. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Nothing's too difficult for thee. Right now, we're in a time in our nation with COVID and everything else. We think we're in the thick of it. But I got to tell you, we're really not in it at all yet. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, Daniel speaks these words. He says, but the people that know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. Okay, in that verse, Daniel specifically is talking about the end times. Okay, what will give God's people the strength in the end times to still do great exploits? When the Antichrist is running rampant on the earth, God's people are still doing great exploits. The question is, where are God's people today when it's really easy for us to be doing it? Where are we at today in a time and an age to where it's easy for us to be doing great exploits? What about the 42%? Why aren't we reaching them? Okay, we can continue to do life in the safety and the comfort of our churches and our homes, but where are the people that want to do great exploits now? Where are the risk takers? 
I get it. For some of us in here, it's, it's hard because our lives don't reflect it. Okay, so many things are going on and so many things are keeping us from what it is that God would have us step into. I need to remind you this morning that nothing is too difficult for him. There's nothing, there's not one thing that you've done that he won't forgive you of because nothing is too difficult for him. If you cheated on your spouse, if you're addicted to porn, if you're angry, depressed, or filled with anxiety, nothing is too difficult for him. I'm telling you today that he can take your life and he can rebuild it. Okay, the great architect, the redeemer, the God that loves you, the God who nothing is impossible for, he loves you absolutely is in love with you. He wants a relationship with you and he can take the ruins and the rubble of your life and he can turn it around. How? Jesus calls it being born again. Maybe you're watching online. Okay, like I, I just share scripture, guys. This is who I am, okay? I'm just gonna tell you, I'm gonna give it to you straight. Jesus calls it being born again, like getting a second birth in John 3, 3, 3. In John 3, 3, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. God loves you and he wants to rebuild you from the inside out, but you have to want to be changed, okay? It's admitting that you're a sinner, admitting that we have a dysfunction and the dysfunction is called sin. We all have it. There's not a promise, a preacher, a program, or a prescription that can ever fix it. It's there. It's you and I admitting that we're broken on the inside and the diagnosis is sin. And the first thing that we need to do is admit that it's there. Second thing, believe that Genesis 1, God made the heaven and the earth and he can take our lives and he can rebuild it because nothing is too difficult for him. Okay, I've watched many people over the past five years of my life who make six-figure salaries who are absolutely miserable because they're trying to do it on their own. Their lives are falling apart, but nothing is too difficult for him. They can't forgive themselves, but God wants to forgive them. Okay, all they have to do is just turn it over. Why? Because nothing is too difficult for him. Some of you are thinking, well, God can't fix me. I gotta tell you, God wants to fix you because nothing is too difficult for him. God can't forgive me. It's too late in the game. God wants to forgive you because Nothing is too difficult for him, okay? And when he recognized that, he sent Jesus to die upon a cross, a death that we should have died. Someone had to pay the price. There was a ransom for sin, and Jesus took it for you and I. He lived the life that we should have lived, but we couldn't, and he died the death that should have been ours to die, but he took it for us. It's believing he died upon the cross for us. COVID, nothing's too difficult for him. Riots, war, a broken relationship, nothing is too difficult for him because God wants you to confess. And this is where I close this morning. It's this confession for me. Church, I, I've been in full-time ministry now for 17 years. And I gotta tell you, I played the game, okay? I used to travel Okay, I used to talk to teenagers. I'd have them repeat this prayer. We called it the sinner's prayer. Can't, you can't find it anywhere in the Bible, nowhere. So basically what I would do is I would say words and I would say, have others repeat after me and boom, you're saved, miracle, done. It's not the case. When I read scripture, I, I read that it's very clear of the process. The apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 10. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's a declaration. It's a very public thing. So now as I travel and speak, I, I don't ask anyone to bow their heads and close their eyes because it's a public thing. That's why Jeremiah did this, did the process the way he did. Okay, not only did he say, I'm gonna buy this, God, I'm gonna follow you because you're telling me to do it, but I want everyone around to know that I'm doing it. Okay, I want them to hold me to it. Okay, when things get tough, Okay, as I bury that in the ground, okay, I want people to hold me to my commitment. You see, giving your life to Jesus, it's not always going to be easy. As a matter of fact, it's gonna be quite difficult to live it out every single day of your life. And I think that we have a lot of people who are saved, but not many who have declared Jesus Lord. You see, the declaration, church, means that it's gonna impact and influence every single area of your life. It's gonna impact the things that you watch on TV. It's gonna impact the things you watch on TV. It's gonna impact the things you read. 
It's going to impact the news stations you watch. It's going to impact who your Lord is. Here we are celebrating Independence Day. I meet a lot of Christians who the American flag is more of their Lord than their God is. It impacts everything. And this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. If you want that type of relationship with Jesus, Paul calls it a declaration with your mouth. Okay, there's nothing too difficult. If you have hidden sin in your life, he'll forgive you. Nothing is too difficult for him. If you have kids that are walking away, you've been praying for them to come back to give their lives to Jesus. Nothing is too difficult for him. If you're, if you're looking for a job and you haven't been able to find one, nothing is too difficult for him. Okay, God is in the midst of every single thing you do, and he just wants you and I to recognize that he is the Lord of your life and to go public with it. So I want to ask... As I close, and as the worship team makes their way up here, if you're in this room and you'd say, Eric, that's me, okay? I've never given my life to Jesus. I've been attending this church, and I've just been, I'm one way here on Sunday mornings, but I'm completely, if people knew the way I lived outside this building, they, they wouldn't say I'm a Christian. Maybe you're here, and you've been a Christian your entire life, but you've only been saved. You've never declared him Lord of your life. You could tell by the things that are in your life, whether or not he's the Lord. It's whether or not you've just punched your ticket, I'm going to heaven, or if there's actually a declaration to where he's leading every single thing that you do. Okay, if you're here and you say, that's me, I'm, I fall in one of those two areas. Okay, I need to declare Jesus Lord of my life for the first time, or I need to redeclare it for the second or third or fourth or hundredth time. I wanna ask you to stand to your feet and make a declaration with your mouth this morning. I declare Jesus as Lord. Just say those words. Is there anyone? Respond now. Stand to your feet. I declare Jesus as Lord. Thank you. Anyone else? It's, it's not easy. Some of you are looking at me like I'm crazy. I get this look all over the nation, so I'm good with it. I'm used to it. Sometimes it's good to be reminded who's actually supposed to be leading our lives. Anyone else? Make a declaration this morning. Would you all stand? Father, we thank you and we give you praise. God, I thank you for the three that stood. God, it doesn't matter if it's a first time or a re-declaration. Re God, you heard, their, you heard their voices. God, I, I praise you, God, for the boldness that they showed in this moment. As a church, we, would, we will never understand missional generosity or even what speed the light means if we don't get this moment right. God, if we don't take a risk and we don't allow you to lead in such a way to where you influence and impact every single area of who we are. God, I pray, God, that throughout this week, God, that your Holy Spirit would just put a check in our spirits if there's things in our lives, whether it's on TV, God, whether it's in our routines, whether it's in our workplace, God, whether it's in our ministry, God, that we have made Lord over our life instead of you. God, I pray I never want my ministry, your ministry in my life to get in the way of who you are to me. Father, I thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to come and challenge and, and share this word with this church this morning. But God, we can't leave without just worshiping you one last time. We thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name.